got a lot to cover today, so we'll kind of briefly go over the intro slides and all of that. But uh, today is our, I don't even know, I think it's our fifth professional development seminar for emerging artists. And today, as you'll see shortly, we are going to be talking about the concept of design thinking. Now, design thinking itself is kind of like a, uh, you know, a very specific term that graphic designers use, but uh, it can apply to other uh, disciplines and, and other, you know, ways of approaching problems. Um, but we'll, you know, get into what that means first. For the people that are watching us on YouTube and enjoying the information, uh, you might be wondering what Distill Arts is. Well, Distill Arts is a nonprofit arts mentorship organization that inspires, teaches, and hires emerging artists from underserved communities. We have multiple programs that we offer to the community, uh, primarily working with emerging artists um, to teach them various skills in you know, the professional world of, of the arts. Um, and that obviously includes this program in particular, our Poet Artist Development Program, which is offering the professional development seminars that we have on YouTube. We also have our ongoing 12-week-long series of bilingual workshops um, for people that are interested in learning how to do more creative writing. Uh, Concha y Café is the uh, name of that program, and it is currently uh, taking a little two-week break, but beginning on April 19th, if I remember correctly, is the next series of workshops. Plus, we offer our art blog zine and our artistic zine, um, which are two publications that are always looking to publish emerging artists. We also have another program that has just started, a series called Community Bridges through our Creative Impact series of workshops. And that particular workshop series is something that um, you're able to uh, see shortly on YouTube, the recordings of the videos, um, as well as the, uh, you know, ways in which you can contribute your artwork for an anthology that we're going to be producing through Community Bridges. Now, for today's session in particular, we're going to talk about design thinking, but I really particularly liked this quote that I found from Frank Chimero. Uh, Frank Chimero is a brand and product designer, as well as author and illustrator of The Shape of Design. So he's coming to this from a graphic designer's viewpoint. But he wrote, or is quoted as saying, People ignore designs that ignore people. What does this particularly say to you, our lovely audience on Google Meet? Because the people made the designs. The people made the designs? Do you mind elaborating a little bit on that? Um, it says that if you ignore the design, you ignore the people. Mm, okay. Wait, people ignore designs that ignore people. Mm -hmm. I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> if a uh, design isn't made of, like that's not accessible to people, then people are going to ignore it. Because yeah. it's not made for them. Yeah, that's a good way to uh, to look at it, for sure. It's not made for them, so they're not going to necessarily have anything to, um, I don't know, like connect with. Connect, right? yeah. Anyone else? In clouding potential, oh, or including potential, regardless of who they are. Do you mind expounding on that a little bit, Mojde, for us? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, you know, what Natalie was saying, I think, is, is kind of along the lines of what I interpret, right? People, if they can't connect with a design or if they can't connect with a concept that's being presented to them, uh, they're just going to ignore it. They're going to gloss over it. Now, my second question for all of you is, what does that mean for you as an artist? How do you feel like this applies to you and your arts practice? This is Ani. I kind of interpret it... Um... Mm -hmm. 
in terms of um, in terms of source, you know, like, um, are you writing from a place that communicates something that means something to people, that means something to the human experience? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one would think that if you're creating and you're re even you're reacting to your environment or an object or something like that, that your humanity is mixed in there. But there, there are some times when um, when an artist will just kind of go after an an idea or a concept or mm -hmm. something that just doesn't have um, a real doesn't come from a sincere or human place. So I, I think. There's, um, for me, it, I, it makes me think of authenticity and integrity, you know, in, as an artist, you know, writing about or creating things that I'm actually invested in as a human. And, um, mm -hmm. and that at least it, that if it comes from that place, then chances are there's another human being out there who's going to be able to connect with it and relate to it, be inspired by it. Right. But then you start with your inspiration is from a human place. Mm -hmm. That makes sense at all. I don't know. I'm kind of rambling. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely think that, that you're you're onto something there. And the human experience is, is a universal one in its own way. And for sure, you know, if people don't find that particular sense of humanity in artwork, in any kind of thing that they interact with, I would say, in the world, that's probably going to mean, you know, they're, they're not going to, you know, engage with it in some way. Uh, and Mojda elaborated in the chat. It means to me that I am included and that uh, that brings responsibility to add a positive impact in creating novel designs. Yeah, I like that Mojda uh, says that, that she feels included and uh, responsible for creating positive impact that's 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 definitely i think a part of what what at least in the graphic design sense we're we're looking at uh abraham would you like to add something well as i just put it on the message can you read that and basically it's a message that a computer will understand Mm -hmm. And the way we as designers or writers, because this can apply to very different things, we have to write thinking who's going to receive the message. Mm -hmm. In this case, a computer will receive it, right? But in the case of the, of the quote you were saying, another person is getting the message. So you have to step out of your own self and think what that person is going to receive. You have to put yourself in the human shoes and specifically your audience, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, I really like that you used uh, binary in the chat to basically illustrate your point. You know, it's true, right? Like, there's no humanity in what Abraham wrote in the chat, and that does make it difficult for us to, one, understand the message, but two, even just feel connected or invested in trying to figure out the message. Um, that is also, I think, a part of it, right? Feeling invested. Um, all of you definitely are, I think, touching on some of the, the core ideas um, surrounding design thinking. So might as well just continue on with what it is. Now, if you're not familiar with the term, design thinking specifically comes from the UX, UI design world, UX being user experience and UI meaning user interface. But, you know, like it says right here on our handout, you know, design thinking is, is really a process for creative problem solving in the short way. Uh, the longer, more developed answer would be that it's a human-centered, non-linear problem solving process. And this is something that helps companies, um, organizations and uh, even like individuals such as yourselves as artists right to you know meet the needs of either your customers your users or your audience um, Ani is absolutely correct in saying that you know if an artist is 
creating work from a more conceptual standpoint, from something that is more theory-based, maybe, you know, that doesn't have a human story to it or a human element to it, you know, that artist isn't meeting whatever the need is of their audience. Therefore, that audience member is just going to walk past it. They're not even going to want to engage with it. But design thinking, when we really look at it on a more, you know, universal level, we're talking about three overlapping concepts that will help you develop, uh, you know, products, um, services, uh, even projects, artistic projects. And in the case of today, we're going to talk about brands, right? And what it means to use design thinking to develop your you know, logo, to develop a website, to develop even something as simple as a flyer or a business card. Even. Now, the three core concepts that overlap in design thinking include desirability, right? What makes a solution desirable from a human point of view? Remember, humanity is always at the center of design thinking. What is actually going to be appealing to your audience member? Feasibility is specifically, you know, what is available to you and what is your capacity to produce it? You know, in terms of technology, do you have a laptop? Do you have a smartphone, a tablet? You know, what are the apps that you're able to use to develop a logo, to, you know, maybe produce your writing um, in an electronic format, right? Like those types of things, those, those technologies that are available to you are what make a particular solution feasible. And then, of course, there's viability. You know, is it something that you can actually invest in? You know, is it something that you can afford and sustain over a long period of time? Those are the things that really um, are central to you developing solutions for yourself. We've talked a lot about that already in terms of, you know, creating a project outline and, you know, creating your budgets and understanding how much it costs for you to essentially, you know, maintain a level of a career, you know, whether that's an entry level point, mid level point, or, you know, a long term career in the arts, you know, those are those are all concepts that are really useful for you to think about as you, you know, establish your plans for your for your business as an artist, and even establish things like your personality on your website. Now, again, you know, design thinking is always putting human needs first and it aims to develop solutions that are most appealing to the end user that humanity again is a really really important part of design thinking now abraham is going to lead us through a little game abraham oh sweet okay uh let's see okay here you go so this is the world's greatest branding game made by yours truly. <laughs> and so let's start with the first question. Uh, by the way, should we divide them in teams, Luis? Um, or I say we just go answer? for it. Let's see, let's see who's, okay. who's able to get the most okay. points. Okay, every man and woman for themselves, except for babies. <laughs> There's none here. <laughs> Hold on a second, let me... Move this out of the way. Okay. So here's the first question. Looking at these three colors, what brand uses them? Let's see who's correct. All three colors? All, All those three, three colors. Miss mm -hmm. Michelle raised her hand first. Oh, Michelle, yeah. I think it's McDonald's and also... Um... Only one, only one. But don't worry, because you were right. Yeah. For yeah, extra credit, though. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah. Got the first good one. job. Good job. David hey. also gets a point there. And for extra credit, what other brands use those same three colors? Miss Michelle? Well, I saw David already answered in the chat. In and out is one of them. Uh -huh. Sorry, I should start raising my hand, sir. Please, sir. <laughs> Carl. Carl Jr. Carl Jr. is another one. You're right. And there's one more. Oh, yeah. She's right. 
Are you el checking those, loco. Luis? Yeah, those honey. Pollo el pollo loco. Good job. Oh, damn. All right. I like it. Is it right? Luis. Yeah, that's right. Was like, that's correct. Yeah, that really? That's correct. Who yeah. loco am I? Damn. Okay, you guys, Chick you guys have a chart. So uh, let's move on to the next one. So be ready with your fingers or your hands and the trigger or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Boom. Oh, did it work? Never mind. Hey. Looking at these two colors, what brand uses them? Okay, hold on. Ah, who Tina. did first? I think. Yeah, okay. Tina. I think Sprite. Hello? Was that Sprite? 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 Uh, not I quite. Seven up. Irish well, Sprite. No. I, I, I think oh, we oh. can give you extra credits. But I saw Annie, who didn't raise her hand, but it's okay. It is in the text. Yeah. She posted the right one. Yeah, Starbucks. Oh, man. Oh, man. So dumb. Oh, Annie is loaded. Yeah. <laughs> Starbucks. Cafe is loaded. Annie, Annie, Annie. Yeah. I have a question. Is it just the drinks or anything else? Because Irish Spring also uses green and white. Yeah. It's, yeah. This... However, Irish Spring also uses yellow, like an orange yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and same with Sprite. Sprite also uses yellow. So. Yeah, it has something on the little, like the, the fruit, right? Or something like that? Yeah, it's like a little lemon. Yeah. yeah. And 7-Up uses red. Exactly. Red exactly. So yeah, okay, very good, so Ani. Very good. And we Moshe as well. And, uh, good thing, yes, Moshe. Yes, Starbucks. Is it okay to type in the in the in the? I prefer raising hands so that way. Okay. Like, yeah, especially. Sorry, I will. Couple, not so right. Like especially because there's people who are not in the message as well. So that okay. Gives them everybody, kind of a chance. And plus, okay, it's nice colleague. to hear you guys' voices. Okay, so great job, Ani. Next one. What brand uses this slogan? Just do it. Tina went first. Nike. No. Oh, damn. Very good, very good. Sharp. Sharp. <laughs> um, well, well, Tina, Tina's getting some good points there. Yeah. And I saw Annie and Michelle sort of raising their hand, but no, too slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. What brand uses this slogan? Can you see me now? Michelle Smith. Verizon. Let's. Oh, good. damn. <laughs> this class is too sharp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, next question then. What brand uses this font? Font is a type of letter. Okay. We have Tina. Tina? Blade Runner? <laughs> um, well, sounds sounds close enough, but that's no. That's good, but yeah. no, that, that is incorrect. No, no, no. We're, we're... You're, you're in the right track, but no. Yeah, brand, not movie. Sorry. Brand. A movie can be a brand if you think about like, uh, but yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody? Talk, Come on. Talk. I don't see. I don't see. Okay, Michelle. Or not? What's a false alarm? <laughs> okay, at this point, I take uh, oh, wait. Nintendo. Nintendo. I don't know. Nintendo. I like no. the ways you, the guys. You guys are heading. You're heading the right direction. So that's that's what I like. All right. Okay. I say, I say we give them one more chance, Abraham. One more chance. Okay. 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 Uh. You, you have hope. With a little related, oh, you guys have the close track, but need to be more specific on this one. One, two, well, three. Okay. So Tina. PlayStation. So, oh, what sorry. was that? PlayStation. Uh, no. Uh, no, but you were close. Oh, uh, yeah. This is the brand. Tesla. Yeah. Yep. I know uh, it was a tricky one. It was a tricky one. <laughs> You guys started pretty good, but you got a khaki. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to move on to the next question. What lucky company uses this font? Again, Michelle. Coca-Cola. Damn, Michelle Very is winning good. the points. Yes, you got it. 
Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Pretty good, Michelle. Okay, you are getting a Coca-Cola after this. Sponsored by. <laughs> Just kidding. You wish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to move into the next question. What company uses the Sonic brand? Sonic brand is a type of sound that a company uses. Let me just put it on my phone because it's the best way to use this thing. Nope, wrong. It goes, okay? So be ready. <laughs> Tina won first. Um, HBO. Damn, Tina's on fire. Or watching too much TV. <laughs> <laughs> You got it. Yeah. That actually, it's cool. I think. Uh... And you know why I remembered? <laughs> you know why I remembered? Because <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, especially after I, I listen to the whole history and that sound. It's called the, uh, hold on, the Static Angel. You guys want to go later? It's a pretty cool story. Um, mm. Okay, we're moving to the next one. The next one. What company uses this Sonic brand? Okay, what is this? Okay, that's not the sound. <laughs> Close enough. Oh, Ooh, Gustavo. Gustavo Reyes went. <laughs> Gustavo? Name that brand. Gustavo, are you here? You're on Gustavo. mute. Oh no, I actually forgot now. Um let's see. Um I think it met um that sounds fishy to me. <laughs> Metro PCS. Oh, not quite, not quite. AT and T. <laughs> nope, not it either. Michelle, Michelle, you're next. Um I don't know it's AT I don't know it's AT and T also or Metro uh, uh no T Mobile, T Mobile, T Mobile. T-Mobile. Uh, I think Said what? we'll accept it. Yeah. Oh, T-Mobile. Oh, Very good. The I have T-Mobile, and I don't know. What are you? I get. I give it to Michelle and 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 uh, Moshe. That's pretty good. That's pretty cool. Okay. We're moving to the next question. This is getting hot. Hold on. What brand is this shape from? Gustavo. Oh, Twitter. Very Her good. Twitter, Raimundo. Yeah. You guys are fast as these ones, huh? Okay. What brand is this shape from? Tina. Olympics. What? Oh. <laughs> you guys Good notice job. that this is basically the shape, right? And they have used the shape in multiple different ways. And still people know it's the Olympics. That's how strong a logo is. Mm -hmm. And also because it has a lot of past and history behind it. But definitely something you can see and connect really fast. So we're, since we're going at it, let's go for the next one. What shape, what brand is this shape from? Annie. Audi. Audi. Excellent. Very good. Yes. And I love the, these two because you see the Olympics and Audi are kind of similar. But it's still distinct enough for you guys to quickly see which brand is which brand. That's how important brand and logos and all that accompanies them are, right? There so, are so thank many you guys. Car companies that have similar mm -hmm. logos. Yes. And this one really stands apart from all of them. I think that's really interesting exactly. that, that they did that. And once you start seeing these in life, you are going to be able to spot what you want to uh, project to the world and mm -hmm. in sense of branding, right? What works and why. For example, these are really simple shapes, but people get uh, attached to them because of what accompanies them and everything that they stand for, right? So that's what you guys have to think about, right? And so this is the end of the game. Uh, applause for you guys because you guys actually did good. Yeah, very good job. Good. Yeah. So I'll switch to Luis. Stop sharing. What is this? Yeah, good job, everyone. Of my informal count, all of you win. <laughs> 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 Nobody's getting a Coke? Come on. 
Not an Audi. Not an Audi. <laughs> not an Audi. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> not this time. <laughs> but like Abraham was saying, you know, the fact that many of these brands, these logos, these even colors and fonts that we reviewed, you know, the fact that all of you were able to recognize at least one of them, um, and in some cases immediately, that really does speak to the power of a brand identity. Right? Brand identity is really meant to establish like a set of rules in which a brand can operate. That's usually something that you would find in what's called a style guide. Right? The style guide, um, in a lot of ways, is kind of like the brand bible. It says what is acceptable for the, uh, the you know, different ways in which a brand can be interpreted. That includes things like your color palette. You know, if you're um, looking at, like, say, uh, you know, the primary color combinations of something like Starbucks, for example. Right? Starbucks has only two colors. That particular green is not just any green. It's a very specific slightly darker green and white but when the holidays come around sometimes they will add a third color in there um, or they'll basically use something kind of like the the brown of their their paper bags as like a third color um, those would be like secondary color combinations there's also monochromatic monochromatic use meaning like where um, what colors are acceptable in both black and white. And I think we had a question or a hand raised. That was Abraham? me. Just wanted to really quick, since you're talking about colors and how specific are to brands. Mm -hmm. I remember the story of this uh, shoe company who basically owns a type of red that you can only use on their soles or something like that. It's a mm -hmm. female's uh, high brand for shoe, uh, high heels or shoes. Yeah, I know that one. Mm -hmm. It's very snoozy, expensive crap. <laughs> Sorry. And no other company can use the red in the way they use mm -hmm. it legally, right? Right. There's, you know, definitely, you know, the ability to trademark certain colors like the Tiffany blue. You know, the Tiffany blue is something that only Tiffany's is able to use within their packaging, within their product branding. So, you know, um, there's, there's certainly ways in which, you know, brands really protect themselves um, and their identity. Uh, and that's that's really what it's about. You know, it's about ensuring that their identity, that their unique voice and everything that they stand for, you know, is properly portrayed in any use. And that's really what a what a style guide is for. And, you know, you might be asking yourself, well, you know, why do I need a style guide as an artist? Well, it's also because you want to think about, you know, like bigger, bigger ideas, bigger term, long term, you know the way in which you use a font and which fonts are allowed to be used when you're creating, you know, your logos, when you're creating your flyers, you know, those are the things that are going to help people recognize immediately that this is you, your work, your unique voice, your personality. You might have work that is maybe more vintage looking, you know, that design aesthetic of a vintage or a traditional style you know, will say something about your unique experience, your unique voice within the artistic world. And that's something that you can translate over into, you know, your website design, your flyers, your business cards. All of those things are, you know, what add like a sense of charm to what your personality is. Uh, was there a question? Someone have a question? Signature yeah, I was, I was going to say, if you wanted a color, I mean, if uh, a person chose a color pa palette, mm -hmm. then it would be on your website. I was thinking, would you put it out on your books, every single, you know, a same kind of color palette? Because I would think it would be different every time. I don't know. On individual products, yeah, probably it would be different. You know, your books are going to be different every time. But this is more specific to, you know, the things that define your brand. So the website, your um, business cards, your flyers, your um, even your social media posts. You know, all of those things, when they're consistent, it helps people immediately recognize without even having to read it, you know, that this is a post from you 
or that this is a flyer from, from you and your organization, from your unique business. So that's what all of this, this uh, you know, brand guideline type of thing is about. You know, a style guide even goes so far as to say what is the actual voice that you use in creating your posts. You know, what is the language, the copy style, as it's called. You know, that, that tone of voice that you use is something that's also part of a style guide. If you think of, like, something like... Um, I'm, I'm, you, some of you might not be familiar with it, but there was a company a few years ago that uh, I used to like buying photography equipment from. Their uh, name is Photo Jojo. I don't know if they're still around. But Photo Jojo had a very loose, informal tone in everything that they did, from their uh, descriptions of the products that they sold to their newsletters. You know, that tone of voice that they used was unique to that company. On the other hand, you have other companies like, say, I don't know, Nikon. You know, Nikon is a professional uh, camera company. They have been around for almost 100 years. And, you know, their voice in their all of their marketing materials is all very formal. It's all very, like, photography-oriented. And, you know, it makes them sound official. And it goes beyond just that. You know, it goes beyond just the voice that they use. Everything else about them, the way they present themselves, is very much about a well-established company. And that's something that you can incorporate into your particular brand. Even if it's only two days old, you can make it seem like it's been around forever by, you know, the choices you make in your, um, you know, colors, your fonts, all of the other things that we've already started talking about. Like the way of reporting football. Uh, yeah, you know, even that. It's, it's, that's a style, you know. There's a, a specific way in which reporters might talk about football, either, you know, as a telecaster or as a print journalist. You know, there's different ways in which those things are communicated. Now, continuing on with the idea of designed thinking and brand identity... Let's play another little game here. Color me bad or color me good. Assign a personality to the colors you see here on the color wheel. We're going to start off with the color yellow. What personality would you all give yellow? What kind of adjectives would you use? Bright, okay. Thank you, Sunny. Mom. Sunny, good. One more. Cheerful. Warm. Cheerful. And I heard warm. Good. All right. We're going to go with just the primary colors. We're not going to do any of the, the blended colors here. But the color green. What kind of personality or adjectives would you assign the color green? Fresh. That's a good one. Down to earth. Okay. Good, good. Anything else? Give me one more. Natural in the chat. Natural. Excellent. Healthy. That's also a good one. Excellent. All right. Moving on to the next primary color. Blue. What about blue? What kind of personality does blue have? Floating. Okay, that's an interesting one. I like that. What else? What other kind of adjective would you use to describe the color blue? Deep. Okay. Moody. That's a good one. All right. The next one, purple. What do you think about purple? Passionate? Okay. What a primary. Wise. I like that. Good. Royal. Excellent. All right. The next one, red. What do y'all think of red? Love. Okay. Sexy. <laughs> Angry. That's a good one. Maybe one more for red. 
Bold. Bold. Nice. That's a good one. All right. And the last one for this particular section, orange. What do y'all think of when you think of the color orange? What kind of personality is that? Alerting. Okay. And happy. Good. Anything else? Ripe. Ripe? Okay. Fall. That's a good one. Give me one more. Citrusy. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> All right. Now, keep in mind, right, the color wheel itself does have a whole lot of other colors that, that are a part of it. But, you know, when we're talking about color and color theory specifically, you know, there's essentially two different types of colors. There's your cool tones and then your warm tones. The cool tones tend to be from like the color green all the way through to about the color magenta. You know, we're talking about like maybe the left half of the of the color wheel as, as pictured here. That would be your your cooler tones. And cool tones tend to have a very particular um, psychological or emotional impact. And if you notice, a lot of the colors that, that you know, uh, or adjectives that you used to describe some of the colors are the same ones that I used here. Um, green typically does correspond to things like nature and, you know, the, the natural environment. Um, they also typically are going to go with the, the concepts of relaxation and calmness, especially if you're talking about things that are more like on the blue-green side. You know, blue-green or like seafoam green, you know, because of the more like tropical, maybe even pastel sort of, sort of hues that you can get, you know, you might still have a cooler sense of color there, um, but with like, uh, I don't know, a lighter, more airy kind of tone. Blues are typically going to be more associated with formal, um, you know, or professional sort of environments and also with masculinity. You know, if you think about brands that use a strong blue color in their in their logos, in their branding, you know, they're typically trying to present themselves in a more professional way. You know, blue tends to be cold, like really cold, and that's often associated with you know, culturally speaking, a certain sort of mindset or a so certain sort of personality. Um, and, you know, the idea that purple is a royal color, that comes from Western society's original view of the color purple, in that purple was the color of royalty, especially in uh, France and, and in uh, the UK. You know, that, that color in particular came to symbolize royalty. Um, but, you know, purple is also, because of its slightly more reddish um, undertones, it can also be kind of on the more mysterious side or even on the passionate side, as someone said. Red, on the other hand, you know, red is certainly about passion, love. Um, it can also symbolize anger, um, you know, and boldness and vigor. You know, red is a very vibrant color that always catches people's attention. So if you're going to, you know, consider using red in your logos, you want to keep in mind that those are some of the things that people are going to be getting from their interaction with your logo, with your choice of red. If it's a darker red, like an oxblood red, you know, that might have a slightly different sort of tone to it in terms of the personality that it gives off. Um, but if it's a brighter red, then you're certainly going to start to get people to think of like, you know, stop signs and, you know, things that really draw in attention. Uh, orange, you know, orange is an interesting color because of, you know, its association with things like summer, um, the fall, you know, it, it's considered kind of a neutral tone. And orange can often be seen, especially around the fall time, you know. Uh, because everything is changing, kind of like orange. Um, but, you know, orange is also the color of creativity in certain cultures. And it's also a color that celebrates earth. 
So orange is a lot of times going to be used in brands that are trying to be more like earthy or organic, you know, and maybe in combination with green, which if you look at the color wheel, you'll see that orange and green are complementary colors to each other. And then, of course, yellow, like we started off, you know, most people were saying happy, sunny, vibrant, you know, those psychological, emotional connections that people have with color really do make a difference when we're talking about brands and brand identity. It's a lot of information right now, um, but does anyone have any questions or observations, perhaps? A gender reveal? What was that? Oh, that was for the blue that you oh, take masculinity and all that stuff. Right. But yeah. also the from the part that you're saying right now, Annie's saying that a lot of restaurants use those colors like a, yeah. a yellow and red to like people get hungry, and that's yeah, right. that's true. That's and true. it's it's related specifically to the fact that here in the U.S., you know, McDonald's started off with the primary colors red and yellow, um, so their competitors obviously started to adopt that, but. If you think about it, red is the color of ketchup, yellow is the color of mustard. And then if you incorporate a like an orange or maybe something that's a little bit more on the brown side, then you start to in incorporate the concept of, of bread and meat. So, you know, that's why like Burger King, their logo has obviously a burger as part of their logo, but those specific colors because it's appetizing. It's what people associate with when, you know, uh, looking to find fast food, really. So, yeah. Great observations. A poem means millions of colors. Yeah, I like that, Mojde. So, now, aside from color, there's also fonts. Now, fonts you know, or typefaces, they are expressive and they do say something, especially about the brand that chose them. So I'm giving you here a few examples of fonts. Tell me, what do you think of when you see this first font, the one called Adele? What are some of the adjectives or personality traits that come to mind when you see the, that one? We can't actually see it yet. Can't see it? Is that, be that better? Yeah, we see it. Oh my gosh, I just realized that some I must have hit closed captioning, and which is why I'm <laughs> my whole screen is ah. <laughs> is the okay. the text of what Luis is saying. I'm like, where did this start? <laughs> But Adele, so the very first one, the top one, Adele. Maybe quirky a little bit. Quirky, okay. Casual, I see. Natalie feels like it's elegant. Elegant but casual, I like that. <laughs> All right. Just as a little, uh, you know, kind of behind the scenes sort of look. That's actually the lo the font that I use for most of the Distill Arts um, website, actually, for the headers on our website. And most of the time, that's the font that I use as headers on our flyers. Because you're so quirky? <laughs> we'll get to that, actually, in a moment. I'm glad that you like the readability of that font. That's specifically why I chose that font in particular. The next one, though, Hobo. It's kind of an, kind of an offensive name, but Hobo, the one that's highlighted now. What do you think? The of, name is fun. The name is fun. Yeah. It kind of it kind of reminds me of um, '60s art design. Very good. Yeah. Hippie. Hippie, the '60s. Good. Anything else? Artsy. Okay. Good. Is there anything that you notice about the font in paragraph form, the way that it looks right now? It's just the regular lorem ipsum filler text, but how easy is it to read all of them? 
Lavalet. Attention? Okay. It's bold. It's bold. Yeah. As David says, it's not quite as easy to read, and partly because it is bold. It hurts my eyes when it's too much of it. Yeah. That's, a, that's something to keep in mind, right? The next one. Courier. The one that's highlighted right now. Courier. That reminds me of an old-fashioned typewriter. Yeah. Definitely that. It's official. Or the receipts from, like, the store or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could see that. It's bureaucratic. Type. What was that, Miss Michelle? The type you use, the font you use for your term paper, your, your research paper. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, if you if you were the type of person like me that still had to type up things on a typewriter, yeah, for sure, it has its place. That's for sure. Yes. The last one, Palatino. The one at the very bottom. Palatino. It's too small to me. Ooh, it's not. It's regal. lovely, but it's too small. Okay. It is kind of small. That's, that's I think, part of the design of it. Um, the uh, reactions that I'm seeing, it's regal. Okay. Sexy, according to Abraham. Um, the best one, according to David. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting one. And according to Mojda, it's difficult to read, which is also an interesting observation. So, David? It's kind of like a combo between Adele and Courier. Like it has a little bit of the strength of the Courier, but a little more flowing like Adele. Yeah. Yeah, that font in particular, you know, is... Uh, it's it's what we call a Roman serif font, right? The, the serifs mean that it has these little, like, little flourishes on the edges. They're kind of hard to see on the screen, perhaps, you know, because of the size of it. But one thing that I want you all to take notice of is that all of these are the same size fonts. All of them are the, the exact same size um, in terms of point size. But look at how big some of them look compared to others. Look how bold some of them look compared to others. Look how much spacing there is between them between the letters, between, you know, the, the words themselves. All of those things affect our ability to read and to understand what is being written. But before we get into that, it's time for a quick little history lesson, and I'm going to pass it off to Abraham. I mean, I should have put my gentleman hat, so this is, we're going to the past. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're going to start with Papyrus. And the history of it. Chris, oh, can you yeah, make it bigger because I'm using your screen? Too. Yeah. Chris Costello, a designer and illustrator, created Papyrus in 1982 using a calligraphy pen and textured paper. Yeah, back in the day, uh, designers used like actually hands and stuff like that. It was really, really difficult to create these um, fonts and things like letters because you really need to be uh, precise. When you nowadays you use a computer, math helps you. Anyways, um, his intent uh, was to create a typeface that looked as if written on papyrus 2,000 years ago. Le a letter set released the typeface in 1983. It is now owned by IPC. And what does it, um, you use papyrus for? It's handcrafted and irregular rough look, as well as its high horizontal strokes, gives papyrus a distinct look that lends itself well um, itself well for a display type. It is uh, especially suitable for anything that needs to look a bit antique. Um, what does papyrus look like? And that's, if you can zoom in, Luis, so they can see a little bit better. So, and yeah, probably you guys have seen it. And papyrus is one of those fonts that are far too popular for their own good. I cannot, for instance, recount the number of times it has been misused, and again, the word misused, for copyright 
now this is or titles in a digital picture some people even use it for powerpoint presentations i was one of those people <laughs> that is why it's one of the top faces that made it to the list of interesting fonts and probably you guys have seen that um the next one is comic sense and the history there may not be designer or on the planet who hasn't heard the of uh, comic sense in fact there may not be any computer using or non designers who aren't familiar with and don't have any opinion about comic sense vincent connor's uh, 1995 design for microsoft has become one of the most popular and most maligned type faces of our time Hold on, I'll Sorry. Go. Yeah. How did it, uh, Comic Sans came to be designed, right? Comic Sans was designed by Vincent Conner, uh, was working at a Microsoft. He was given a, be a beta version of Microsoft Baba, a comic software package designed primarily for young users. The package features a dog called Rubber with, with a message balloons set in time new roman that's another type of font you will see a system font oddly used um unsuited to be uh used for comic text basically canner's inspiration for comic sense came from the shock of seeing again times new romans used inappropriately and you guys can see in the picture below and you scroll a little down that is the little dog called uh, rubber and that's the typeface. So you guys can see it's it's okay, but it's it's not what I would like to see in the comics. Yeah, it's definitely not a comic style font. That's yeah. For sure. Times New Roman. And so the guy move on, and that is the design he came with, right? And under it, it's basically a comic sans feature in a cover for the Designer Weeks magazine. That's the type of font he created. Mm -hmm. And this is really cool the, the way he describes this. Uh, what does you, uh, Connor, thinks of Comic Sans detractors? Because there are many, right, Luis? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people who don't like it, right? I think most of them secretly like Comic Sans. I am one of those. I really like it. Or at least wish they had made it. Interesting fact the main designer at Twitter tweeted that the most server space is used by. Complaints about first airliners, uh, second Comic Sans, third Justin Bieber. So not even the Bieber can beat Comic Sans. <laughs> Just saying, right? I mean, the the, yeah. the creator has a point. Has a point. It's famous. It's maybe not for the right reasons, yeah. but it's famous. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. Empirica, and this one's definitely my favorite from the list. Um, history is not a smooth or steady path. We know this is true in politics and progress, and it's true in design too. Looking back into the past, some relatively recent letter forms are nearly unreadable today. The long S at the top of the Bill of Rights or Father, uh, father Back. Uh, farther back, uh, the elaborate initials in the Book of Hells, whether by orthography or rendition, some letter forms are incredibly marked by their era. But as you each ever farther go each farther into the past, older styles don't necessarily keep getting more alien to contemporary eyes. The Trojan column built in Rome in the second century is ancient by definition, an artifact of a long gone empire. Unless you read Latin, you can't read its inscriptions. But Romans had many different styles of letters, but business transactions, taking notes, making graffiti on walls. But the moment capitals of Rome, the uh, monumental capitals of Rome inscriptions broad shapes of C D G H O N constraining with a narrow B E F 
PRS are what we associate today with the Roman Empire. And Luis, can you uh, lend me the screen? So I'm gonna give you guys a little field trip. Thank you in a little bit of field trip. Can't afford to send you all the way to Rome, but we can at least visit virtually. See guys, I take you to places. So here we are in LA, let's travel the world, please. So just to give you a little bit of context of what, where are we at, here is the Coliseum, right? So we saw some people killing each other and then we're moving on. <laughs> Here, here is the place we're talking about. So this is the uh, Trojan column that we're talking about. And then we're gonna go back to the presentation. We have more pictures because this one doesn't actually have good view of it. So that's when you get inside, that's outside the little park that's over there. And you see this, uh, can you point the little square that it has on, uh, on top of the door? Yeah. Oh, not too far back. Uh, it's up. Yeah, I know. Uh, this is a little bit harder to do then. Yeah, it's, it's a word. It's always has its ways of... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't think it's going to work here. Well, yeah, you guys see that little uh, column that has in the middle, it has that inscription on top. So basically right? this rubbing, right? Mm -hmm. So this image that you see now is what's on the column. In the column, yeah. yeah. Anyway. And so this style is what people of the time would associate with their empire too. Tobias uh, Free Jones explained, I like to think of this style of lettering as the first ever corporate identity job. Even if you couldn't read, you knew this was the state speaking. Those are really powerful words, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Roman voice of authority has been a starting point for many designers in subsequent ages. Ferrer Jones first began working on the font inspired by Roman inscriptional style over 20 years ago. The culmination of the project is Empirica, designed by Frederick Jones and senior designer Nina Stosinger, reinterpreting the original in 1994, designed as a headline font. Amplifying and expanding the original characters set over a range of weights, adding in low cases an italic face, which the Romans never had, and including two sets of figures and support for hundreds. And this is the style after they work on it, right? And you guys probably have seen in banks and and offices and then um, places of the government. So it's, it's really uh, basically a, a font that carries a lot of history and context because the Roman Empire, again, was the most powerful empire of the time. And so people view it as a high thing, as a high class. So a lot of people continue using mm -hmm. the font and it survived. And, and basically because of these people, they thought it will work in this context and we use it for, again, banks and important places, mm -hmm. right? Official it's, places, right? Exactly, exactly. So, typography. It's more than just the font, of course. You know, typography uh, really talks about or sp specifically refers to all of the ways in which the written word is presented visually. You know, um, the voice of your brand the way in which you speak the tone that you use with you know your flyers your posts on social media you know all of that stuff it's going to be reflected hopefully in the font that you choose because every font 
has a personality. Um, but there are certainly things that you need to think about when you're doing your design thinking overall. The priorities should always be in readability and legibility, both of them. Because remember, design thinking is really human-centered. If your audience can't read what you are writing, then, you know, it's it's not going to be something that they'll want to even engage with. They're going to just ignore it. They're going to pass it by and it's going to stay forever wherever it is in, in, you know, loneliness. But some tips for readability to think about as you design not only your, your you know, logos and, and your flyers, but even when we start talking about later down the line, your books, the chat books that we actually put together through Distill Arts. You know, the fonts that you choose must work against both dark backgrounds and light backgrounds. If a font, you know, when it's in black and is written over a white paper or, you know, is on a white screen with a white background, you know, if it's very small and very thin, it's going to be easier to read. But if you were to invert that, and if you were to turn a very thin font into a white colored font, and it's on top of, say, a purple background, that's going to be extremely difficult to read. So the font that you choose should be able to contrast well enough against any color background. You also uh, want to avoid fonts that are only in uppercase or only in lowercase. You want to have the ability to switch back and forth between uppercase and lowercase. Empirica is a good example of a font that's mostly uppercase, but because, you know, over time they recognized that they also needed lowercase characters, you know, they did add that. But there are some fonts that don't have that at all, ever. And if they do, they'll, you know, maybe be just small looking uppercase letters, if that makes sense. So do be aware of all the different situations in which you may need to select your font. That also includes things like kerning. You know, letter forms themselves, you know, by themselves might look nice, but when they're in a group together as part of a word, some letter forms have a smaller, tighter kerning. If we go back up to the uh, other part of our handout here and we look at hobo, right? This font, hobo, has a very, very tight kerning. You know, there's n almost no space between the letter forms. That really tight kerning can make it extra difficult, exceptionally difficult to read at smaller sizes. Whereas, you know, your wider fonts like an Empirica, you know, when they're when the kerning is a little bit longer or wider, the distance could also potentially make it harder to read if something is too wide apart. Um, that's rarely the case with most fonts, but, you know, something to keep in mind if you're maybe doing like a really, really large, um, maybe like poster size, uh, text based image or something. Um, there's also letting too the text, uh, distance between lines that's called letting. And that refers to, uh, way back in the day when, uh, printers used to have to by hand place their, their fonts. They had to place their letter forms and use little small blocks of lead to separate the lines of a, of a text. That does change with the um, size of a font as well. So, you know, another thing to keep in mind. And then there's alternate typefaces like using bold and italics and regular. You know, regular is typically going to be the easiest to read, but using bold or using italics creates what's called visual hierarchy. And some fonts, when they're smaller, especially in italics, just like with the kerning, you know, it makes it tighter, so it's going to be more difficult to read at smaller sizes. And bold fonts, you know, when they're larger, that's usually going to draw people's attention first. So if you want to use just one font, but have like bold and italic and regular all part of your design you know consider using things like bold to i don't know act as like say a headline and then regular to act as your body text and then italics to just maybe emphasize one thing here and there try as, as you best can to be strategic 
when using the alternate typefaces. And all of that comes down to legibility. How easy is it going to be to read? You know, there's different types of fonts, different families of fonts, as, as they're called. The Roman serif font is going to be inspired by Roman letter forms. You know, things like Empirica is a Roman font. It's a serif font. It means that it has these tiny little, like, extra wings, we'll call them, on the, on the letter forms themselves. It'll be thin in some areas and bolder or wider in other areas. Um, Times New Roman or Caslon are examples of that. And then there are Gothic fonts. Gothic fonts are fonts that are usually just one single weight. The line of an H is always going to be the same. It's going to be consistent from top to bottom, from left to right. Helvetica is an example of a Gothic font. So is Avenir, one of my favorite fonts. Avenir is actually pretty much what this entire slideshow has been using up to this point. Um, Avenir is a simple font. It's pretty easy to read and it has a lot of different typefaces. So it's pretty versatile. I like it. There's the sans serif fonts. Not all of them are going to be like a gothic font, which is, you know, universal in weight in terms of the line weight. Um, but sans serif fonts are fonts that don't have those extra little wings on, on things like the letter T or the letter F or on the letter L. Uh, examples there are shown. You know, we have Optima or Arial. Those are both sans serif fonts. There's also a type of font called a slab font. You know, slab fonts normally will have serifs, um, but they also are just generally heavier fonts. They're, they're meant to be headline fonts. Things like Rockwell or American Typewriter. Um, those kinds of fonts are fonts that uh, really are best used in limited amounts. Um, kind of like your ornamental fonts, like Phosphate or Herculaneum, as you can see there. Uh, ornamental means exactly that. They're meant to give a sense of style. But they're going to be best used when you're like maybe using one word in that font. And a script font is the same. A script font is a font that is designed to look like it was written by hand. Uh, the most common one is obviously Papyrus, but there's also things like Zepfino, which you can see on the slideshow here. Remember, all fonts have a personality, and it's really up to you to choose the font that best reflects your unique voice, your brand's personality. You know, for a logo, I necessarily wouldn't recommend Zepfino, but, you know, if it's going to work for your style, then use it. You know, just keep in mind that it has its limitations. Um, it's also really important to pair complementary fonts. Just like you pair complementary colors with each other, you want to pair complementary fonts. Usually for things that are going to be like, you know, flyers, um, business cards, all of the print collateral and also your web design stuff. You know, headline fonts versus body fonts are always a good way to give people a good sense of visual hierarchy. The most common combinations are going to be a Roman serif font with a Gothic font or a slab font with a Gothic font, kind of like how I demonstrate here in this slideshow. And again, just really try your best to not lean or gravitate towards ornamental or script fonts, especially if you have to write something that's longer. You know, you don't want to use those kinds of fonts in, say, your book, you know, as you're writing poetry, uh, switching back and forth between those kinds of fonts. You'll, you're going to really have a difficult time connecting with your audience. Um, try to just simply be consistent. Keep it simple. Keep it clean. And as an example of why something like Zapfino doesn't work very well with other fonts, um, on this same slide right here, you'll see that Zapfino is taking up a huge amount of space and it's also covering the line below it. So another example of why certain kinds of fonts are best used for maybe one unique usage. Does anyone have any questions so far? Just for titles and main titles, right? 
thank you to Steve Jobs for the fonts. Yeah. You know, if it wasn't for people like Steve Jobs, you know, most most computers actually would be loaded with only like maybe Times New Roman. Um, or something very boring like that. Goth fonts, hells yeah. <laughs> All right. Is papyrus in Word? Good question. Um, papyrus itself isn't in Word necessarily. Papyrus is a font that's usually installed on a computer. Um, so you can use papyrus not only in Word, but also in other uh, apps that you might have access to your, your system fonts. Um, but like we mentioned before, papyrus is one of those fonts that's been overused and you really want to avoid using it um, for most professional applications, honestly. Um, if you go around town, I can almost guarantee you that you'll see papyrus in use. And a lot of times when it is in use, it's going to be overwhelming. It's actually going to be overused, like in menus. Um, I've seen it used on like banners and uh, people's um, like the storefronts, storefronts. Really. Yeah, you know, uh, papyrus is is just like Comic Sans. It's it's actually very divisive, and because it's overused, it's one of those fonts that people just kind of begin to ignore, um, no matter how good it might have been at one point. So, uh, it might be in Google Docs depending on your system, uh, but generally speaking, web fonts. Uh, fonts that are specifically made for the internet are going to be fonts that, that are more, you know, what you'll have access to in Google Docs or uh, on websites that allow you to build your own website. Um, there are certain fonts that, because of the, the way the internet works, you know, they, they are universal. Um, so you can use them across all mediums. But Yeah, it's like you were saying with the super fancy fonts, like if you're using the online just because the way of the spacing online works, like the lines, yeah. it just breaks everything apart and can fuck up your website. Yeah, which we might find in our presentation today. All right. Now, remember, ultimately, whether we like it or not, we're shallow. We judge things by how they look, you know, and visual appeal and in and desirability are really important when it comes to design thinking um, and design thinking specifically related to branding and branding personality. You know, I already mentioned it before. Visual hierarchy is really, really important. You want to make sure that you are guiding your audience members' eyes from top to bottom, from left to right. You want them to understand very clearly where they are supposed to get certain kinds of information from. Um, that's where that focus on readability and legibility is really important when you're designing websites, when you're designing flyers, um, even when it comes to designing a book. If you decide that you want to go into, you know, designing your own chapbooks and zines by hand or on a computer. Those kinds of things are really, really important. Um, visual hierarchy establishes for us a, a roadmap, ultimately, for how we dissect information and how we interpret it. Uh, it's really important to keep your fonts simple and to be consistent. Use only one, maybe two fonts, um, and always use the same font with the same style same typeface uh, as a header and same goes with your body fonts only use you know one consistent body font ultimately and it's also really good to really limit your color palette you know as you develop your brand think about how many colors most widely recognized brands use right it's usually going to be between two and three colors if we think back to the, the example of the three colors that are, you know, in the very first uh, part of the game, the red, the yellow, and the white, we know now that McDonald's is one of those brands that uses those three color combinations. But there's also Carl's Jr., and there's also In-N-Out, and there's also El Pollo Loco, and, you know, a whole lot of other knockoff. I mean, let's face it, a lot of knockoff mom-and-pop shops 
restaurants that are trying to be within that restaurant space. And if you think of something like Starbucks, which only uses their unique green with their white, um, you know, that's that's a very simple color combination. And, you know, those color combinations are easily translated into black and white also, um, which is another important thing to think about when you think about your color palette. Then in your overall design aesthetic, like we were talking about before, you know, if you're into things that are vintage, if you're into things that are more uh, earthy or, you know, nature based, you're likely going to lean towards certain kinds of colors. And if that's part of your brand's personality, then you're likely going to lean towards, you know, softer, more rounded fonts, fonts that are reflective of nature fonts that are reflective of maybe, you know, a root system or the shape of a leaf. It's very, very hard to find sharp edges in nature. Curvilinear design is what it's called, right? Everything is curved in some form or another. Um, curves typically are associated with softness, motion, calm, and femininity. I mean, whether we want to admit it or not. The opposite is true for straight lines. Straight lines and hard edges, the rectilinear form or approach to design elements, is going to really invoke the idea of sharpness. It's going to invoke also the, the, the idea of stability and action, um, strength, and masculinity. You know, those are things that we have been conditioned to believe. And ultimately, if we want to, you know, sort of change those those beliefs we're in our brand you know maybe going to be limited to to what we can do but you know there there are ways in which you can incorporate both elements to still come across as professional to still come across as inviting and to also you know make your brand uniquely represent you i have some examples here um, but the first thing to remember is that, you know, design thinking, again, it puts human needs first, right? You really want to think about what makes a human, what makes a person connect with your brand before anything else. And that's how you're going to develop a solution that is appealing to them. That's how you're going to develop a style, a tone, a, a visual brand, um, visual identity that is going to appeal to whatever it is that that person is looking for. Logos are usually the first thing that people think of when they think of brand identity. Um, they don't often think about all of the other stuff that we've already covered. Um, but as a reminder of what makes a good logo, a good logo is going to be simple. It's going to be original. It's going to be timeless and versatile, meaning that it can work in a multitude of colorways usually sticking to either the monochromatic black and white um, or its basic colors right um, and then it's either going to be a word mark a symbol or both word marks are things like the distill arts logo right the one that's that's highlighted there that's called a word mark um, pretty straightforward by what that means it is a word it's a series of letters that come together to form a logo. Um, a symbol is, again, pretty straightforward. It's like the Distill Arts badge, which you see here in the three different color variations um, because there are three different identities that Distill Arts uses. The black and red one is for art block. You know, that's one of our zines that we produce. Artistic zine has a different visual identity, but what unifies them is the universal logo. The, comment there abraham oh really quick one on the art blog definitely because it's really super focused on art yeah and also love when they came up with the the font that you use there like like a brush because mm -hmm. back in the day because of the pixels you weren't able to do these kind of uh, fancy uh fonts so i, I really love those ones the brush fonts. Yeah. Yeah, I like that font. Um, and when we chose it uh, between me and Angie and Jeremy, um, you know, we chose it specifically because of that, right? Because it represents art in its own way. 
If you look at some of the other examples here that we have, things like La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, Abraham and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. When you look at that particular logo, it doesn't always capture your attention, partly because it's not exactly simple. It's definitely original. It's unique among all of the other ones that are here. Um, and if we were to convert that to black and white, it would probably work. You know, there's enough uh, variation in the color where, you know, some of the gray tones might come out. But the question is, does it really say to you what La Plaza de Cultura y Artes is just at one glance? Probably not. So keep it simple. Right? Keep it as something that people can look at in passing and know, oh, that's what they do. That's what they are. That's ultimately what you want to get. That's what you want to achieve with your branding. And when we talk about going from print to web, you know, it's basically all the same. If you haven't noticed, this is actually a literal duplicate of the other slide. It's really, really important to remember. Visual hierarchy is, is essential for people to get information from whatever it is that you design. Right? Visual hierarchy is going to really um, establish how people interpret information. The color palette that you choose should always be complementary. You know, try to stick to whatever two or three colors you select ultimately as part of your brand. And be consistent with your design aesthetic. You know, whether it's curvilinear or rectilinear, try to just, you know, be consistent and always try to portray your voice through all of these things. Now, let's see who did it best. Let's see who was able to translate their unique look to their website. Abraham was so kind to do the research here for us. We have three different authors that we're going to be looking at. The first is Anne Rice. Um, Anne Rice was born October 4th in 1941 and passed away in 2021. Uh, she was best known for her gothic fiction and her erotic literature and funny enough Christian literature too. Um, and the Vampire Chronicles is the series that she's probably most uh, recognized. For. I didn't even know she died. Yeah, December eleventh. I posted. <laughs> Tina, I posted. <laughs> yeah. The second website we're going to be looking at is by Isabel Allende. There you get her full name. Um, Isabel Allende was born August second in nineteen forty two. Um, she's known as kind of like a contemporary magical realist uh, author. Uh, her best known work, at least now, currently, is The House of the Spirits, La Casa de los Espíritus, and City of the Beasts, La Ciudad de las Bestias. Um, and she is definitely the world's most widely read Spanish language author. Um, so we're going to look at her website as well, and also the one and only Stephen King, uh, born September 21st, 1947. Most people know who Stephen King is. Natalie doesn't. <laughs> Natalie approves of this list. <laughs> no need for introductions. <laughs> yeah, no need for introductions there. Um, Stephen King is uh, very, very well recognized. The man. <laughs> the man. Now, the first website, Anne Rice. What are your first impressions of this website? Her name comes first. Her name comes first. Sometimes. Remember what kind of <clears throat> what kind of writing she did? Yes. <clears throat> Is that reflected in this? Is her style reflected in this? Serious and heavy passion, the color red for sure. Yeah, I would say that her website does reflect her style <clears throat> and probably, you know, the the like bulk, I would say, of her style of work, right? The genres in which she she wrote in, which was uh, erotic literature, gothic literature, vampire stuff, you know, and the occasional Christian uh, work of literature, too. Um, so, 
you know, the color choices are appropriate and the fonts are easy to read. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot going on, but it's still a pretty digestible website, I have to say. Moving on, are you able to see this website? This is Isabel Allende's website. What do you notice here? It's not so busy. Yeah. She has flowers. Mm -hmm. Like a flower to our brand. Yeah. Simple, elegant, plain. Definitely plain. How about the blind colored people? The colorblind people? Yeah, unfortunately, Classy. we're not. Um, you know, Moshe does bring up a good point, though, about colorblindness. You know, people that are colorblind oftentimes are unable to see certain colors so it'll just look either kind of brownish or like faded um so you know something to think about if that's an important part of your 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 work right um <clears throat> isabel allende's definitely got more of the modern looking website right it's a very simple website very plain something that you'll notice though once you start going to the tabs up here like, look at all of these books. That's a lot of books, right? You go to the about, there's a lot of things about. Under media, a lot of stuff that comes up under media. <clears throat> Same thing with this, her foundation, just one simple click. Her contact, one simple click. Overall, I would say that this website in particular is a very good website. It's a well-designed website. In terms of its visual look, um, visual hierarchy, right? We know where to go. It's very easy to find what we're looking for. Um, this could probably be, you know, maybe cleaned up a little bit. Uh, you know, this could maybe have been executed a little bit better. But aside from that, this is a solid website. Last, the king of horror, Stephen King. What do you notice about Stephen King's website? Black background? Yeah, nice black background. What do the fonts look like? Are they consistent? Seems to me like they generally are. Some of the header fonts aren't always consistently used as header fonts. But aside from that, it's a pretty solid website. A lot of dead space here, unfortunately. That's just the abyss. <laughs> the abyss. Yeah, maybe it works, you know, based on, or the on boy. style. <laughs> yeah. Right? Does it reflect what we think of when we think of Stephen King? <laughs> it reminds Angie of MySpace. That's a good observation. Yeah, he has a book called Abyssal. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why it reminds Angie of MySpace. And that's because this particular website is actually a blogging site that was modified to be a website. Um, that's why you have this funny, like, it's called a widget. You know, this latest news widget. It's super long, right? And you can scroll for a while and not find anything else. Um, that's something that as a designer, I would probably fix, um, you know, because you don't want to have too much dead space. When this renders on a person's phone, for example, that rendering is going to make it actually harder to find what you're looking for on a phone. If you're looking at someone like Isabel Allende's website on a phone, because of how simple it is, that homepage, you're going to be able to find what you're looking for a, a little bit faster. In comparison to Anne Rice's website, though, if you look at this on your phone, this is going to be really hard to actually read on a website. Um, you can tell that this was also done with a blog website that was modified to be a person's website. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not, not terrible, I would say.
Abraham, raise your hand. Well, super professional places, well, not usually for personal, but big companies actually design different type of websites. One for their uh, web or the computer, another for the phone, another one for tablet. Mm -hmm. Some other places, like when you do your own website, have like an automatic uh, default that it transforms mm -hmm. into things, but it's not as great. But big companies actually create each type of website for different, um, mm -hmm. uh, what's it called, formats. Yeah. Yeah, some of them do. You know, some of them have that, that like desktop only version. And then some of them have a mobile version. This is usually what it's called. The mobile version sometimes will translate over to tablets as well as um, phones, smartphones. Um, and there are some websites that are like perfectly adaptable across either one. The Distill Arts website, for example, I use Square. Um, that's, that's the service that hosts our website and I used one of their templates. And that actually works really well across pretty much all platforms, whether it's a, uh, you know, desktop or laptop, or if you're looking at the Distill Arts website on your phone, it's generally pretty easy to, to read and navigate. Um, but those are things that, that you want to take into consideration when you start building your own website, uh, whether it be using a free platform like WordPress or uh, even Blogspot, you know, which is more blog centric. Um, but, you know, there's there's certainly ways in which you can create a website that is low cost or free um, that will serve the purpose of presenting your information in a way that is useful for people. Um, now, as we begin to wrap up here, there's something that I want all of you to do. I want all of you, and this is a homework assignment that doesn't necessarily have a due date, but this is your takeaway. Think about what makes your particular artwork, your style, your poetry, your short stories, whatever it might be, what is it that makes it appealing to your audience? You know, there's going to be certain elements, and if you make a list of, say, adjectives that describe your artwork, your approach to creating your artwork, that's going to help you start defining your brand identity. Once you have some of those things down, think about the colors that correspond to that. You know, if your work is majestic, we'll call it, you know, if it focuses on royalty, maybe purple is the way to go, right? If your work is about nature and, you know, happy stories or, uh, I don't know, the, the conflict between humanity. You might want to go with, like, maybe a, a yellow-green um, or some sort of a yellow-orange kind of color as part of your color palette. Remember, you can do up to three. More than three colors is probably not going to serve your, your purpose. Um, try to keep it to two to three colors that best represent your unique personality. Um, and begin creating that style guide. You know, the purpose of a style guide is for you to be able to always look at any given situation for marketing purposes, for um, really mostly for marketing purposes. But uh, let's say at some point you have an intern or a volunteer that's helping you um, to create folders or flyers, excuse me, um, or social media posts, or you actually have the money to hire someone to help you as an assistant, they need to know what is appropriate for your brand, for your voice, for your style, for, you know, everything that, that is related to your artwork and your business as an artist. Um, you might as well write all that stuff down. Last but not least... I highly encourage you to explore one of two options, either Adobe Creative Cloud Express or Canva, and start to really play around with making your own logos and making your own um, flyers and even a web page if you want to. Um, one of the things that, that you're able to do with both Canva and with the Creative Cloud, Adobe's Creative Cloud Express is you're able to, um, with a free account, you can start to play around with design concepts 
and you can do it for social media posts and you can do it for things like flyers and other print collateral, business cards and that kind of thing. If you want to get more access to um, more customizable design templates or to actually put up your own custom colors, for that you will have to pay. You know, and that's where, remember, the feasibility and the viability, you know, those are two things that are part of the design thinking process that you do want to consider when you start thinking about your brand, your business as an artist. To help you out, and Abraham's obviously promoting there his own website, um, but definitely check it out so you can see, you know, some, some, uh, some examples of, of, these concepts in action but if you go to the distill arts website which you hopefully can see on your screen right now you know you can explore the website a little bit and see my approach to designing our website remember this was done using uh, a template that's available through square i did pay extra for this particular service but when you go to the distill arts website and you go to the donate and support page on this particular page, you can scroll down past all of the other ways in which you can support. And here are some ways in which you can get discounts for brand new Adobe um, accounts. It is free, like I said, to start off with an uh, Adobe Creative Cloud Express um, user profile or whatever. Uh, Creative Cloud Express also has mobile versions. So you can create using either your cell phone, if you have a smartphone um, that is compatible with the app, or you can do it on a tablet. Um, and it's, it's a really good resource. To show you what Creative Cloud looks like, um, the Adobe Express Creative Cloud looks like, uh, here is what it looks like when you log in. This is the one that I have for, for Distill Arts. Um, if you go to the plus sign here, you can create all these different things that you have as an option. Of course, you know, I do pay that extra amount for access to things like um, Adobe Photoshop and, and uh, Illustrator and InDesign. So I have the full suite um, of, of uh, software. But see, if you go to create even like a flyer or, you know, anything that you see here, you have a ton of, of stock imagery that you can use. Um, you can create templates. As you can see here, you can remove backgrounds from photos. You can even do videos. Um, I recently did a video that uh, I uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, and that particular video is part of a grant proposal that I just submitted um, yesterday. And this little video is really just, you know, simple pictures. It didn't take me very long to create it. You know, we have... Uh, just the, the Distill Arts logo is already there um, because I do pay for that extra feature. But, you know, if you wanted to have that kind of feature, uh, it's only $10 a month. And like I said, you can start off for free. You get a lot of access with the free version, um, including two gigabytes of storage that you can use across various um, Adobe apps like Lightroom um, and Photoshop. Canva is the other option that I mentioned. Canva is also free. There's also a paid version if you want to use the advanced features. Um, the only drawback with Canva is that you can't do web pages and you can't do videos, um, branded videos, like you can with Adobe Creative Cloud. But that said, well, actually you can. I take that back. You have the video editor there. Um, but with that said, you know, you can do um, custom prints with uh, Canva that you can't do, not necessarily anyway, with Adobe's Creative Cloud. Um, <clears throat> like t-shirts and that kind of thing. But, <coughs> excuse me. But there you go. Resources. Tina? Abraham, did you come up with that little camera design? Yes. Yes, I created that logo and then uh, use the same type of font for throughout the website. Does anyone have any questions <clears throat> or final comments? It was a lot of information. You Are know, we turning so something in for that homework sometime? 
if you want to, yeah. <clears throat> you know, you can uh, create, like, let's say a flyer, right? And then we can give you some pointers on how to um, think about visual hierarchy. Or <clears throat> if you want to workshop, say, your brand identity, you're more than welcome to do that. Abraham? Uh, Jess, uh, well, I actually, like, when they were doing their timeline and projects before, I suggested a couple of them, of you guys, um, to look into websites to send people to, like, I don't know, you want to have an event or you're selling a book and things like that. So this is going to be really helpful for you to start building your website, yeah. to think what type of font represents my work or the, one, the way I want to portray myself. <laughs> And also, what type of website do I want? For example, you saw the Annie Rice. It definitely speaks about her style. Even the background has like the kind of Victorian uh, mm -hmm. colors and everything and, and designs. But it definitely was crowded. I told Liz this, like it has a bunch of stuff going on. Maybe you want to approach it the way of the, what was the other name of the, I forgot the name of her Isabel name. Isabella Allende. Allende. Yeah. Yes. That's more clean in the way that you just access and then you look what you want to look for. Mm -hmm. The other ones that are selling you a lot of stuff, uh, Annie and Stephen King, because they mm -hmm. have a lot of stuff to sell you. Yeah. But definitely, yeah. like, different approaches, right, for work, works for you. So definitely look into these assignments and think of really hard, because this is going to carry on throughout, like, your whole, like, branding. So it's going to last mm -hmm. you for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And keep in mind, you know, branding, just like with anything, it can evolve over time. So it doesn't always have to be the same color. It doesn't have to always be the same logo. You know, at some point, if you feel like you want to invest in, in you know, having a professional designer uh, revamp your logo at some point, that's always possible. But if you have the core elements already in place now, it's going to be a lot easier for you to work with a graphic designer who will then update your, your work. So, you know, um, yeah. And to answer most of this question about the option for multiple languages, there are some websites that even if you're using a template, you can activate a feature that um, allows for automatic translation, depending on where a person is, is uh, viewing your website from. Um, I believe the Distill Arts website has that feature. So a person in like, I think, Latin America, for example, could view the website in Spanish without me having to create a second one. Um, but if you want to do your, you know, your own custom second website that is unique to the other language that you want to use, um, you can definitely do that. Um, Ani? I noticed that uh, other than um, Miss Ayenda's website, mm -hmm. um, that like Stephen King and Anne Rice both use these dark backgrounds yeah and i personally love color and i love the the bold use of color in websites but you know accessibility has become a really hot topic right now for for websites people actually suing companies and um you know the the ability to for for people who are not able who are have uh, vision mm -hmm. um disabilities or challenges, you know, not being able to, to see uh, contrast or um, yeah. dark backgrounds and things like that. And um, I know as, as independent artists, these are probably not issues that are, no one's going to be coming after us, I don't think for, you know, but I am just wondering, like, are these issues that we need to be aware of, you know, as we're thinking about design and, and brand well, just like I said throughout a lot of the, the presentation, you know, readability and legibility are really important when it comes to selecting a font and even for designing a logo, you know. Um, that's why the colors that you choose should also work in black and white situations. Um, you know, the Distal Arts logo, the greenish color that we use, um, it's an, like a, almost like a blue-green. Um, and then the yellow orange that I use, when those translate over to black and white, they are gray, obviously, both of them gray. Um, and they're a tone of gray that is dark enough to where they reproduce okay. Uh, on the web, most websites, depending on, on how you're constructing it, 
you know, they should have accessibility features that allow for people to read them. Um, if you're using text blocks as opposed to images, you know, that's why it's really important to, to use actual text in your website as opposed to only images. Um, because images or text embedded inside of an image, you know, is not something that a person with vision impairment can read. So that's just something to keep in mind for, for the kinds of things that you design. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's accessibility features that people with vision impairment have already as part of devices that, that they would be normally using. And then on the back end with HTML5, a lot of that stuff has also been um, kind of fixed, I want to say, or at least worked on and improved upon. Um, the larger companies are probably using old uh, versions of HTML that, that that doesn't really work with anymore. That's why they invest a lot of money in updating their website. Um, Abraham? Oh, sorry. Uh, like, for example, some squares, for example, you put an image, you can actually put the name of the square. In mm -hmm. case, like uh, like we were saying, some programs are good at reading what you're selecting. Yeah. So you can also do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes like, to uh, websites, there's uh, alternate text that is something that you have to input yourself when you're um, laying out the image or whatever. Um, and so if the image doesn't load properly or if a person is on a, on a reader, a, a special reader, they can hover over the image and still read the text that you set up as your alternate text for that image. So those, those kinds of things are, you know, good to be aware of um, as, as you design your own things. Uh, but that might be also something that, you know, would you might want to invest. If that's a, a real concern for you, you probably want to invest in, in having a graphic designer help you. Any final questions or comments? Well, as always, um, you know, if you do have any kind of questions, it is a lot to digest, I know. Um, but if you do have any questions or comments, uh, you can always get in contact with us. Um, you can also visit the Distill Arts website to, uh, you know, find out about the different discounts that we're able to offer through Adobe's uh, affiliate program. Um, you know, and there's always the chance of, you know, Abraham and myself being able to, to give you some, some feedback on any kind of work that, that you're doing. Um, for everyone that is joining us on YouTube, thanks for sitting through it. For those of you joining on Google Meet as part of our program, uh, I do hope that you found this very useful, um, and hopefully informative enough to maybe feel confident. In, in your own design skills. I mean, as artists, you're already practicing design thinking, but, you know, you can practice design thinking in a lot of different areas of your life, including how you develop a program, how you develop a budget, and obviously how you develop your brand identity. So thanks again, everyone. And for this evening, I say good night, and I'll be seeing you all very soon.